Welcome to another episode of the Focus Bee Show. Today I'm here with Stoyan Yankov, a wonderful friend and fellow coach. Stoyan is the productivity ninja. He has worked in startups, incubation programs, done mastermind retreats, and recently is about to launch his book, Perform, The Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. Thank you so much for being with me today, Stoyan. Thank you for having me, Katie. It's always a pleasure to have uh, conversations with you, to talk about productivity, to talk about performance, and I'm really grateful to be on the Focus B. Thank you. Yes, well, it's lovely, lovely to have you. Let's dive straight into the topic. I feel there's a lot of misconceptions in terms of time management and productivity. Why is it that you feel that productivity is such an important and interesting aspect of both personal and professional growth? That's true. Many times people understand productivity as this constant strive to to get things done and to achieve results, which is part of the equation. But what what I feel productivity is important about is it's really about living mindfully. When you learn the principles and when you apply the principles of productivity, you start uh, living by intention. And it, it is both in your professional and your personal life. So you actually learn to spend your time and to progress in the areas that are most important to you. And you also learn to be very good in saying no to things that do not matter as much. I absolutely love this because uh, as you know, my podcast is about interviewing experts in high performance and mindfulness. And this is because exactly, I believe that high performance, productivity, mindfulness are all the same in some ways or all very, very nicely related to one another. Yeah, definitely. I I don't think it's all about, uh, you know, hustling, 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 getting results, achievement. It's part of the equation. I, I, you know, I'm a, you know me, Katie. I love to move <laughs> forward. I love to build stuff. I, I love to be busy with, um, and I know when I say I love to be busy, you're probably going to say <laughs> busy and productive. There's a difference in that. Uh, but, uh, but that's not what I mean. I love to, to be busy mindfully into producing results. Uh, at the same time, I think, the realization that it's not only about getting things done, but it's actually doing it in a mindful way is uh, is something I'm really interested to explore further, to teach people, to inspire entrepreneurs to do as well. Yes, I think this is really the most important part of productivity, knowing what to focus on and being able to say no, like you said earlier. This leads me to our topic that we have also in common, which is a sort of sub area in some ways of productivity, which is focus. As you know, my brand, the Focus B, this podcast, the Focus B show. Focus is so important both for mindfulness and for productivity. And in your book, Perform, you go through the five villains of focus and execution. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Correct. So uh, the focus and execution is a major area from the PERFORM methodology. Uh, So this is the F letter from PERFORM, more (laughs) or less. And um, we've been trying to, me and my co-author Cristobal Alonso, we've been trying to find a way to, to make it easy and simple for entrepreneurs and for people who are reading a book, who are joining our workshops to to get a picture of, uh, of those villains, so to say. So if you, if you have a look at the book and if you have the book, you can, you can see illustrations with, with these villains, but basically the, the five villains of focus and execution are lack of clarity, number one. Number two, shiny object syndrome. Number three, multitasking. Number four, procrastination. And last but not least, perfectionism. Nice. I'm letting like the audience listen and absorb those five. Let's go through each one, one by one, 
The first one is probably my favorite because I feel that clarity is so important. Tell us a bit more about lack of clarity. Yes, in, in the world we live in, we're having so many choices. There are so many demands that sometimes we get sidetracked and we, we get into this cycle, this rhythm of doing things. But if you're not clear what you're after, if you're not clear what's your priorities, what are your focus areas, it's really difficult to stay focused actually. If you don't know where you wanna be, how do you get there? And um, it's, uh, there's many ways you can, you can beat this villain, so to say. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is to really spend time and put time in your calendar, block time for you to get clear what your priorities are. And planning is, I, I love this quote from uh, Alan Lacane. Planning is about bringing the future into the present so you can do something about it now. And this is why productivity is so important. This is why having a system for planning and time management is so important because when you know what you're after, when you're intentional about where you want to be, be it professionally, be it personally, then it's easier for you to come up with the action plan and you build it backwards. And when you have clarity, these are the most important goals. These are the most important priorities for me this month, this week, this day. It's easier for you to stay focused. And if you get unfocused and a sidetracked to get back on track. Yes, I'm wondering, do you have an example in your personal life or professional life where you felt that you lacked clarity? I do many, many times. I mean, I let me just try to think for a specific example. Um, just by the way, guys, uh, we might be productivity coaches. We might be getting a lot of things done. It doesn't mean you are, we are like always focused. Like, uh, I gotta tell you <laughs> many times uh, a month, I might feel like a little off track and then I have to redo, rethink the, my priorities, rethink the way I spend my time. Is it connected to those priorities? Um, probably a major a major story like this was a few years ago when I was um, a few years ago. It's been 2013. <laughs> <laughs> seven years ago. Seven years ago, maybe. I was finishing my master's degree in Denmark and I was studying finance. So my dream at the time was to become a Wall Street banker. <laughs> But uh, all my free time, I was uh, spending on producing videos and producing movies. So probably there was this moment of, you know, why should I do what I study? You know, should I, should I rethink my priorities maybe? And, and should I actually start doing things I'm most passionate about? And at the time that I was movie making, so I decided I'll focus, I'll make this my priority. I want to be a professional filmmaker. And by the way, a lot of people listening to, to this right now, they might be thinking as, as well, maybe, maybe you're working on a job that you're not happy about. Maybe, maybe you're just involved in many projects that are not giving you this sense of purpose. So it might be a good sign to, to rethink things and to rethink Am I doing the right things? And in, in the framework of a, of a startup, of being an entrepreneur, oh my God, there's so many things that are constantly bombarding you. So it's super important to learn to set your priorities, not just once, not just at the beginning, not just every quarter, but every, every single day to have a look at your priorities, to reevaluate and say, is this the things that are most important for us to bring the business forward? Are we spending enough time on our core priorities? And do we have clear goals, measurable, clear goals? We can also talk about the uh, different tools that can be used, but, but generally people are so focused on the tools and I, I love tools. I'm building tools, I'm using tools. <laughs> but at the beginning, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a lot about your habits, 
your mindset. So lack of clarity, it's, it's a beatable, beatable villain. <laughs> it requires some discipline. It requires some self-management, uh, but uh, it will give you so much in terms of focus, in terms of result, in terms of happiness. Yes, thank you for sharing all of this, Diane, and your personal story also. And I think you probably had a similar phase when you moved from video production into productivity also. That was probably a similar sort of transition and clarity. And I also feel that I'm constantly reviewing my priorities, constantly asking myself, am I working on the right things? I think this is even more the case when you have your own business or like you said, in startup. I feel every Monday morning or every first of the month, I'm like, okay, let's recap. What am I working on? Is this the main priority? Where am I putting in my time? Where am I putting in my energy? And this is sort of a constant refresh to ensure that we have sort of laser focused clarity. That's it. That's the key word. Laser focused <laughs> clarity. Of course, because I'm all about focus. I have to, <laughs> I have to, you know, practice what I preach, but also it helps me. And I feel it's a, a huge part of performance is really, like you said, knowing the direction in which you're going. I mean, look, I, I had a client, uh, who called me once and he was really overwhelmed. Um, and I think we were not having sessions. He was actually quite on, on track before. We were not having sessions for, for a few months. And then he called me, he was kind of like in a panic zone. <laughs> and he asked me, Stoyer, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. Uh, he couldn't breathe, you know. And I asked him, what's going on? He said, well, look, my business is thriving. I'm getting so many customers. It is amazing on the one side, but I feel so overwhelmed. I feel like as much of things I do, I'm always having more. I go home, I'm stressed. I don't think I'm, in, I'm enjoying the process. I think I, I need to change. I'm just so overwhelmed. I need some style magic. And I'm like, okay, man, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, have a, let's have a talk. And ask him, Federico, what, what are the top three things you'd only do if you have all the time, if you have all the money? What are the top three vital few things that if you do them, you're excited and it brings the business forward? And he was like, oh, I know, man. One, two, three. Okay. How much time do you spend on those three things at the moment? And he was like, oh, shit, man, 5%, <laughs> probably 5%. Okay, where do you want to be? 80, 80 or more. Okay, let's talk about it. What has to happen for you to be able to be there? Maybe not tomorrow, but at some day, in, in a few weeks, in a few months. He was like, man. I should hire somebody. <laughs> I'm like, okay, do, can you afford it? Yeah, man, I have so much business coming in. You know, I, I have so many clients, but I just didn't have a time to, to sit down and to think about it. I'm like, okay, do you know who should be the person? How should they be? And so on. And like, okay, yeah, sure. A few weeks later, he calls me. He's like, man, I'm smashing it 80 plus percent, right? Um, and I think sometimes we just don't take the time to, to stop. Especially if it's not your routine. You know, you have your routine with uh, time management, with planning, with these prioritization, goal setting. And I think sometimes people, people make it complicated. You know, it's, it's, it's about consistency. Even if you don't have the perfect methods, if you're consistent, if you consistently create space in which you see the whole picture, you reevaluate your priorities, and then you create an action plan that's matching those priorities, and you're good to go. Consistently creating space. I think that's really, really a wonderful sentence because it illustrates 
what is really important here and this is why it's also linked to mindfulness because when you're mindful you realize where you're putting your time where you're putting your energy and you choose to spend some time on reflection to spend some time pausing to spend some time creating space and in that space you gain the clarity through that one call where this client of yours asked you and you asked him a few clear questions that helped him to re-change his clarity and his focus that's all it takes and sometimes i have this i don't know if you have this also story but before i get my own coaching sessions before i'm coached i take 10 minutes 20 minutes half an hour to do a brief review what i want to discuss and sometimes that helps me as much as the coaching session because it's a time of reflection i was like oh i've got it all sussed <laughs> then they ask me a few questions and it helps a bit more Anyway, I think this is a, a nice transition towards this shiny object syndrome, because if you're not clear about where you're going, it's very easy to be tempted in a lot of interesting new directions. How do you feel they both relate, this shiny object syndrome and this lack of clarity? They are very related, but at the same time, I think... Uh you might be very clear and you can still have this shiny object syndrome. You're not uh, immune from it. So the shiny object syndrome is, um, could be seen very clearly with uh, small kids. So if you have a kid or if uh, your brother or sister have a kid, um, you might have, uh, if you play with the kid and you give them a toy and they're playing with a toy, for example, you can see how when they always get attracted by the next shiny thing, right? The, the thing that's flickering and, and they forget about the rest of the things. Uh, so that's why when you go to an apartment uh, with kids, it's, it's, you know, it's toys all around the place. But this is what we do as adults as well. Entrepreneurs are exceptional at this. <laughs> and, though, and though this could be very helpful, to come up with new ideas, to see new opportunities, and you should always be open-minded. So it has positive sides. The problem is if you cannot manage and control it, the shiny object syndrome, it's, you know, the, the novelty, the new thing is always more interesting. Oh my God, there is new, this new marketing strategy. We should definitely do that. Hey, let's go and let's target this group as well. Hey, what about the, the one that we were already focused on? We've only spent a week. Yeah, 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 but this new thing is amazing. We should, and we all have it to some extent. So the question is, how do we manage it? How do we take control, take ownership? And, and um, when there is this new amazing opportunities before we take action and commit to reevaluate, to see how are they matching our goals, our priorities and are they somehow conflicting with the, with the goals, with the projects that we have already committed to? I can definitely see myself in this. And it's interesting because I never formulated it in this term. Now when it happens again, I'll think of you, Stoyan, and I'll think the shiny object syndrome. The way I generally look at it is, what is my focus? Is this aligned with my focus or can it wait? And actually, I procrastinated the podcast for two or three months, like purposefully procrastinated, so postponed, because I was afraid it was a shiny object syndrome. I thought, is this really important right now or do I just want something new and fancy? And after a while I thought, no, I'm really excited about this. This is generally aligned and then I started. But this temptation, it's huge. And every second there's a new you know, productivity tool I want to try or marketing, or maybe I should do more Twitter. And I, no, Katie, you don't need Twitter. <laughs> You're busy doing LinkedIn one thing at a time. So it's a very interesting sort of frame of reference to think of it this way, shiny object syndrome. I like the term also. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's many ways to deal with it, I guess, but it's, it's not so easy, especially for people who naturally get attracted to to novelty to shiny things uh, but uh, there is a way to if you have will if you have discipline to to get better into into beating this villain a question that comes to my mind is 
how do we know, like in the example I gave with me starting the podcast, how do we know if it's just a distraction, just something shiny and new and interesting, or if it's actually a great opportunity that can move us forward? It's a brilliant question. I wish I had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, look, look, um, you sometimes don't. Sometimes you have to try new things, especially as an entrepreneur, you want to experiment you, you want to do experiments you want to try things and but honestly if you have your priorities in place so if you're very good with the first villain so you have clear priorities clear objectives you would know if you actually take the time to to see this new idea and to put it against the ones that are already existing and you actually say how much time is this going to take us what is the opportunity cost? You know, if I'm not, if I do this, then that means I'm not doing this. So if we put two weeks in this project, that means we're taking away two weeks from this other thing. Let's talk about it. Does it make sense? What is the probability for us to actually succeed with this? I mean, you can do simple risk management analysis, right? And you can, you can as you said, purposeful procrastination, you can do purposeful experimentation. Let's try this for two weeks. That's gonna take us 15 hours, 20 hours, 100 hours. Okay, we purposefully decide to experiment and, and see if that would be the right thing. The problem is when, when you have the tendency to say yes to everything and start new things, because it's exciting, it, it could be so much opportunity, but you have so many commitments at some point that you actually cannot deliver of quality and you're always late on your uh, deliveries and commitments. Yes, one thing I use that is very similar to what you're saying is if I say yes to this, so in my example of starting the podcast, if I say yes to starting the podcast, what am I going to have to let go of? There's only so many hours in the week, we'll have the same amount. And if you're already working hard and efficiently, you know that taking on another big project that also takes up time, it means sacrificing other parts and if you're not willing to let go of anything then you can't really start this new like project that's that's the sort of the way i look at it which is a similar way to what you were saying in terms of risk assessment and opportunity costs exactly opportunity cost uh, you know stress tested um, it's always good when you put it out there let's say if you are having a startup to have your team to explore it before you commit so you together explore it. You can, you can use tools as the, the six thinking hats of Bono, right? Like when you put the black hat and you, you have to give some negative feedback. Why is it not going to work? What is the negative parts of it? And uh, that could give some really good pointers. But uh, as everything else, uh, you know, to those of you who are entrepreneurs and listening, you got to deal with uncertainty and you got to deal with, Hey, this feels right. Let's do, let's do this thing. But again, in terms of productivity, you can do it all as David Allen, our, our friend, David Allen says, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Nice. Very true. Very true. I feel there's so much more to explore in this topic. And I'm also thinking there's a bunch of people listening who don't know about the thinking hats of the Bono. But if I open that, <laughs> I'll put a link in the show notes for those who want to check it out because otherwise the whole episode will take on another tangent. And let's do a little sidetrack and move to the third villain, which I love, which is multitasking. So you what love I'm... to multitask, Katie. <laughs> no, I love this as a villain because I go on and on and on about uh, monotasking although I've read recently it's actually called single tasking but I always refer to it as monotasking what are your thoughts on this it's very easy to to start playing with this villain right multitasking as it's called I was researching where it came from and it, it turned out that the definition of multitasking came for describing the behavior of um, computer processors so multitasking, you give a lot of tasks to a computer and then the processor deals with those things. And we somehow acquired this and use it in when we try to describe the way we work. I'm really good in multitasking. <laughs> it's even, people even like showing off and they're, 
they're trying to say how good they are at multitasking. And I think some of them actually mean I'm really good in managing multiple projects, which is a completely different thing. But uh, some of them <laughs> refer to I'm good into doing three or four things at the same time, which, Katie, we've been discussing this many times. According to cognitive science, it's, it's not really possible. Uh, because basically we are wired as uh, human beings to focus on one thing at a time. And when you do two or three things at a time, you have to switch from one thing to another. And you probably have heard about this research. Uh, I believe it was funded by CNN. I will send you the link so you can put it on the post-it notes. But basically what, uh, what they did is they did... Uh, they started how people perform IQ tests and one group of people, uh, they were given uh, the opportunities to smoke weed and then do an IQ test. And the other group had to multitask on email and then they had to do an IQ test. And the people who smoke weed lost less IQ points at the test afterwards. Uh, so like the overall conclusion was that um, multitasking makes you dumber than being stoned. <laughs> yes, and it's true because there is a certain amount of energy you put into starting something i mean think about it as a as a train one of those older trains maybe when the train stops at the at the train station it takes a few maybe half a minute before it gets into speed again and this is the same with your brain. You, you're working on the contract and you're like, oh, I have an Instagram message. Let me just, uh, okay, oh, let me get back. You have to start again. And it takes, it takes time, it takes energy, it makes you dumber. Uh, and uh, it's, it's actually really dangerous because you create the habit uh, and you're the, you're the focus bee. <laughs> so you can speak uh, for hours about this, but uh, it's, one of the most, most, most important thing, if there's one thing you should get of this episode is really create your day, create your workload as such that you really only focus that one thing at a time. You can call it monotasking, you can call it single tasking, you can call it whatever you want. But when you focus completely, you know, I'm here with Katie right now, we're doing this podcast and I'm fully focused on being present with her. Okay, I can drink my coffee because that's not something cognitive, but I cannot do anything else. Otherwise, I will not be as effective. I will not be as focused. I will not produce the results that I want. This is how I actually managed to complete uh, our book. <laughs> uh, I don't like writing. I really don't like to write and to, <laughs> to, to edit. And I'm a very extroverted person. And you know me, I love to talk. Um, so how did I manage to, to write this book together with my co-author? Well, blocking my time. I blocked 90 minute chunks in which I had a specific objective to write two or more pages. And I gotta tell you the first uh, 20, 30 minutes, usually nothing comes around. I get annoyed. I try to get into it, but then I get into it. And, and I think a very, very good tool very good reminder for those of you listening is, is get one of uh, these notebooks, paper notebooks. And when an idea comes to you, when something uh, as a project comes to you, you just write it down on your piece of paper immediately. So this is more or less like the monkey that wants to play with you. The monkey, the monkey mind is trying to distract you. Check your Instagram. Oh, you didn't do this. Okay, cool write it down, get back to doing what you were doing. And you teach your mind to focus. You build a muscle, which is beautiful. Uh, so that's, that's my take on multitasking. I definitely, I'm a big promoter and I love um, to be fully focused on one thing. You said a lot of amazing things. Love the analogy with the train, it takes a while for it to get started again. And I love this example also of putting things down. I do the same. I generally have a piece of paper next to me. And if I suddenly think of something, I write it down. And I realized this, it was years and years ago, and I was still working as an engineer. 
And as I was processing data, I'd suddenly want to Google something. You know, your brain just goes to that place where you're like, oh, I want to check this recipe. And it was just, I remember thinking this is so not relevant to my job and I'll just go down the Google rabbit hole <laughs> and this is not, you know, efficient or professional. And so I'd started at the time a to Google list. <laughs> so I'd write down all my Google ideas, which were from, you know, how to do more cardio on a yoga mat to, uh, you know, recipe ideas to any Google things I wanted to look up. And recently I use it the same, but less of things I want to Google, to be honest, that's not what comes most into my mind, but maybe projects and ideas and people I need to send an email to. Because like you said, if you stop what you're doing, whether it's writing your book, like you said, it took you a while to get into flow. It took you a while to get into it. So if you stop to then write that email, then you might read other emails, then half an hour goes back. And then it's so much harder to go back and write in your book. So that's why this list of writing it on the side is one of the tools. There are others like, you know, taking breaks regularly and having maybe blockers to block the websites you use a lot. I mean, there's different tools that we can use, but one of the most important things I feel is really having that intention before you begin. So when you were saying, you said you do those two pages, you decided that beforehand and you weren't going to let anything derail your attention. So I think that's probably one of the most important elements is the intention, the commitment beforehand to only do one thing. Yeah, and I, I love what you said uh, about, uh, in a way it comes, it starts with scheduling but purposeful scheduling, like you block the time, you block your whole day. And it's really about defining what are all the potential possibilities of how you can spend your time, then defining the, the results or the outcomes, which is, could be a completely full episode we can speak about, but uh, taking the time the previous day or in the morning, if it works better for you to really go through all the potential ways to spend your day and then you block it into your calendar or you, you schedule it if that word feels better. And now you have a full day with time blocks with specific result for each of these. And when you are here, when you're present, you don't have to think about anything else. And if the monkey comes to you, which would, it will, <laughs> you can easily say, hey, monkey, get away. You know, we can play, but not now. We can play. <laughs> nice. So a few things to summarize what we're saying in terms of multitasking and single tasking, scheduling ahead of time, blocking time, being committed and setting the intention before you begin on what you'd like to work, having a piece of paper to jot down any distractions and I, and concepts and just knowing also how detrimental multitasking is. We also haven't spoken in terms of hormone, the reason why we love multitasking or we feel a tendency towards it because of the dopamine effect, but it actually releases a lot of cortisol, the stress hormone into the body also. So it's rewarding uh, quickly and instantaneously from the dopamine, but then induces stress in us. So it makes people more tired and drained at the end of the day if they multitask and less efficient. Basically, it sucks. Don't do it. <laughs> do single tasking. Try to decrease it. Try to decrease, <laughs> decrease it. Like, it at least, of I don't think I don't think it's possible really a hundred percent. But the no. moment that you get aware about catching yourself doing it, you get back to the main things you were on, and then you you're focused again. Nice. Let's move on to the fourth villain. What is it? Procrastination. Oh, <laughs> any another procrast big topic. <laughs> any procrastinator out there listening to us, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw a research and I'm not sure about the exact data, the exact numbers, but um, it was something around, it was done in Britain and they said that more than I think more than three or four hours a day, uh, British workers are focused on, uh, are procrastinating. Like out of an eight hour working day, they're procrastinating three or more hours. Uh, and we do it all the time. Uh, procrastination is about doing what you know you shouldn't do. It's not your most important thing, but you do it anyway for some reason. 
Uh, and there's many reasons why we procrastinate. Uh, there's a, a very interesting author called Leo Babauta who, who says that procrastination usually comes from fear. So we're afraid of something. Maybe, maybe you were overwhelmed and you have so many things to handle, but you don't know where to start. So instead of actually starting with something important, you go to your social media and let me, let me check my Instagram. And so you get a little dopamine boost and you feel good about yourself. Uh, so procrastination is huge. Um, again, all these villains are interrelated. They, they play together. Uh, so, but I'm curious, Katie, how do you deal with procrastination? Are you ever procrastinating yourself? <laughs> I think we all do. And it, like you said, it's related to the other villains. So if you have a, a lot of clarity on what you want to achieve, then it makes it harder for you to procrastinate because you just know that what the priority is. And I recently found myself having a task to do that I didn't want to. And I literally felt the uh, resistance to it. So I put it on as my most important task of the day. So the first thing to do. And I remember I looked at it. I was like, oh, wait, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and I was about, I was almost like moving in my seat. I was so uh, reluctant to do it. And so no, it's my most important task. So I just settled myself, asked what would be the easiest way to begin. And then I went about it. And I think in my case, the resistance came like a lot of the time from it being not 100% clear how I wanted to do it. So if you're not 100% clear about what you're going to do, then you don't want to do it. You want to do something that's clear and straightforward because you need to think a lot more and reflect a lot more when it's not clear because you need to make it clear before you can do it. So that's one of them. And I think, like you said, it is linked a lot of the time with fear, fear, overwhelm, uh, should external sort of um, obligations and it's um, it's tricky but one of the things that helps most is noticing it so when I noticed it that morning I was about to procrastinate I could have done 20 different tasks but I noticed it and I feel that's what helps most yeah it's uh I mean no everybody procrastinates what can i say everybody procrastinates and um clarity really gives perspective and, and helps you so if you know what's the the important task but then you also have to find your tools to motivate yourself to get it done um and sometimes you just have to trick your brain i'm gonna do it and this is this is a very simple strategy that can help you guys if you're procrastinating a lot and um, I've been procrastinating. I gotta, I gotta admit, writing the book uh, at some periods, and the way I kind of get myself into it is just to, like, you play with a kid. You know, you say to your brain, "Hey, um, I can. Uh, let's just do it for two minutes, right? Like, uh, you're not gonna write the book. Let's just start working on it, just for five minutes. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to deliver any pages." Let's just do it for five minutes. So, so like often it's about tricking yourself to start doing it. Because when you get into it, it's like, oh, okay, that's good. But usually there's this resistance before that, that, uh, that we're trying to resist, right? Yes, yes. It's a fascinating topic. And the fifth, fifth villain, perfectionism, is also really closely re related to it. We won't go into it today. I'll probably do another episode on perfectionism. And so that will be a different one. And so the five villains, lack of clarity, shiny object syndrome, perfectionism was number four, multitasking and uh, procrastination. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today, Stoyan. Thank you for being here. And uh, where can people find you? People can find me on stoyanyankov.com. Uh, they can find me on Instagram, on LinkedIn and uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. And then if you're curious to learn more about this, you can go and visit the performbook.com and um, yeah, pre-order the perform book. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Stoyan. Bye.